All right, thanks for bearing with us. So I'm Gregory Wells, as you just heard. This is my colleague, Veronica Gold. And then we're gonna to talk to you today about the phenomenology of the ketamine experience. And so we will introduce our work of psychotherapy with the entheogen ketamine. Uh, we will as well briefly talk about a sudden setting in our clinic, because we realize that even though ketamine is well known, this way of working with ketamine and psychotherapy is not as well known or unavailable in many places. And we hope to sow seeds of the possibility of using this medicine in assisted psychotherapy the way we do. Um, we will not talk about the physiological effects and the antidepressant effects just by themselves of ketamine, but want to talk about the phenomenology and experiences that people have reported that we've worked with and the meaning that they make out of these experiences. Uh, we will use a lot of direct quotes of our patients, which we have all permission to do so. So before we get started with that, just a, a few moments of, of gratitude. Personally, I'm extremely grateful to be here. Uh, two short days ago, I was in hospital just around the corner here receiving stitches from a, a quick bicycle accident in Berlin. Um, so very, very happy to be standing here before you. Um, <laughs> And thank you to great German medical care, much appreciated. Um, and also grateful to um, everyone who has come before us and has made this work possible for us. Um, the, the people who've trained us and mentored us and supported us, uh, the indigenous leaders that we have learned from, that we've been supported by. Um, we've had the, the wonderful experience of being trained by uh, Michael and Annie Mithoffer um, through the MAPS training program as well as Marcella Otolora in order to work on the MDMA-assisted uh, MDMA psychotherapy for PTSD program. Of course, I have to um, thank Stan Groff for also introducing us to this work. Um, who have I left out? Oh, and in terms of the, the ketamine work, we wouldn't be here today without the, the training and support of Bill Wolfson and Julaine Andres, the uh, Ketamine Training Foundation in California, as well as Raquel Bennett, um, and we'll talk more about both of those, or those three people later. Um, so Veronica, Veronica and I are both incredibly grateful to be able to call ourselves psychedelic therapists in this, in this exciting time. Um, and as I mentioned, all of the people who've influenced us, we've had great role models who've helped us um, to become facilitators, um, guides, midwives, caretakers, as we've supported so many people on this path of, of wellness and healing. Oh, and one, one final thing, actually, I really want to make sure I don't miss this. Um, I'd like to encourage all of us in this room um, to think about how we can commit ourselves to further diversifying this field. Um, by including more indigenous people, more people of color, more LGBTQI people, more gender diversity. Um, it's something we desperately need in this field. Thank you. So just briefly, ketamine, it doesn't need all introduction, but it is the only psychedelic medicine that we can uh, legally prescribe in the United States and use in conjunction with psychotherapy. Uh, it is a, in the U.S. Schedule III drug. The, it is classified as dissociative anesthetic. It was developed in 1961, used in surgical anesthesia, and widespread during the Vietnam War. Um, the physicians started to observe the emergence phenomena, which is the psychedelic effect of the medicine that were described by patients. And that became the interest of the research of psychiatrists and psychologists. And what we are now using in our ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Um, this, earlier this year, esketamine has been approved by FDA uh, for the treatment of treatment-resistant depression, and so it increased the interest in ketamine, even though the way how we work with ketamine is quite different than um, esketamine, and, and um, we'll talk a little bit about the difference in the next slide. So, the, you know, ketamine has been sometimes criticized for not having the lasting antidepressant effect. And it was largely based on the research with the IV ketamine without psychotherapy. So we believe that it has everything to do with the set and setting that this research has been done. 
And our emphasis is on the medicinal work, on the psychotherapy that is facilitated by ketamine. And that is essential to our approach. Uh, our approach is relationally based, based on developmental trauma theory, attachment theory, and transpersonal theory. So in these photos, you can see the difference between a, a typical infusion room there on the left and our office on the right. The infusion rooms are often quite clinical, very medical, um, a lot of medical equipment. Um, staff may be treating multiple people at one time. There may or may not be a, a trained therapist on site to, to be with people. And then on the right, we've made great efforts to make our office more like a home setting. Um, the patient is reclined, it's actually a person who works with us, um, is reclined on a, a nice comfortable bed, um, has eye shades, music that's chosen to support um, the session. There is always one or two therapists in the room with the person at all times. Um, the the treatment, treatments last anywhere from two to three hours. Um, let's see, so you know, one of the criticisms or questions has been, well, why do you really need people in the room if someone's anesthetized in, in a dissociated state? Um, even when a, a client is highly dissociated, um, it's important, and this speaks to the importance of the therapist. I didn't need to figure out why I felt sad. It just felt important that I be with sorrow, and you held me in that, and you held me in that. I could hear your calm, boundaried, empathic, and thoughtful responses as I came back to my words. I have been held and helped in so many ways by so many people in my life, and the way you provide care is unique and profound. I'm so grateful for you and your teachers. Thank you. And this was a person who was pretty much unconscious for much of the time, or appeared unconscious. So the, one of our main guiding principles is the trust in the inner healing intelligence, the ability to heal from within people themselves. And so kind of like when we have a wound, we maybe disinfect the wound, but it's the body that heals itself. And so in the same way, we are approaching the work with the medicine, and so we are providing the conditions and the support for our patients to be able to heal from within. We trust the medicine, the process, and the inner healing intelligence that supports the clients to trust it as, as well. And so everything that comes up in the sessions is welcomed. We are encouraging people to share with us as much or as little as they like whenever they're able to. And we are not encouraging to making any connections and interpretations as they're in the sessions. So that each session follows up with the integration session. Um, in the next slide, I mean, it's kind of like an overview of the different ways how we work with ketamine and different doses, and we'll go through the next slides with all of those um, types, so from low, moderate to high doses. Oftentimes, we just start with the low dose and gradually go to the higher doses, and the variety of experiences people have in the therapy sessions. So we'll start with um, the empathogenic psycholytic psychotherapy states. And, and first I'll just say that, that people can kind of cycle through these in, in one session. So we might administer what we, you know, plan to be a low dose session and somebody might have, a, might have full ego dissolution, but there's sort of a trajectory that people go on and so not everybody has all of these experiences during a treatment, um, but this is sort of a, a roadmap, I guess, of how, how we work. So we emphasize the, the experiential nature of this work. Um, the treatment is being, the nature of the treatment is being essential for growth and transformation. The medicine combined with therapy uh, facilitates experiential learning. So in low doses, ketamine often has this empathogenic effect. Um, there's an increase in awareness of the body, which is interesting for something that's a dissociative. Um, people feel, often feel comfortable. Um, relaxed, uh, they feel an increase in empathy, um, compassion, warmth, feelings of love and peace. Um, their mind is often in a, a dreamy state of being. It's, it is sub-psychedelic though, so people can pretty easily come out of that state. But it encourages more openness and, and lowered defenses. 
So that state can also be combined with guided imagery, um, visualizations, meditations, um, in order to help resolve long-standing issues, traumas, um, interpersonal conflicts, things like that. And so this might be, you know, less known way of working with ketamine, but we find it very helpful, and especially for people who don't have experiences with other psychedelics, this is kind of a perfect way to start. There is more openness, ability to communicate. People are still in present and relaxed state, but there is lowering of defenses, and uh, people are uh, able to have more empathy towards themselves. So here's a quote of one of our clients. I'm looking at myself with tender understanding and compassion. What a relief. I realize how hard I have been on myself. There is no need to constantly beat myself up. I would never treat anyone else the way it, the, this way. It makes me sad. I treat myself the way my father treated me. I have taken it on and I'm ready to let it go. Even though therapists have pointed this out to me in the past, I am seeing this clearly for the first time. So the following this session, the client reported less attachment to his issues, kind of increased ability to notice when the crit inner critic was coming up and not blend with it in the same way. So in the moderate dose, uh, there is very common to have the out-of-body experience where there is a complete separation from one's body. Uh, there is a significant diminishment of the defenses, but the person is still aware of oneself. Yeah, so this out-of-body experience is likened to a sort of a, a trance state or being in kind of an awakened dream state. Um, clients might access repressed memories. Um, they, they really get a, a break from um, their day-to-day -day ruminative sort of mind. So we see that the essence of the trauma experience as, as threefold. It's a break from or a timeout from day-to-day -day mind. And that's sort of what we um, explain to patients going into um, a treatment. It's um, often a, a reduction or elimination of, of negative thought patterns and also a, a reduction in habitual thought patterns. So it tends to be much more experiential and less verbally mediated. Um, there's often less potential for self-expression and, and dialogue. So people often aren't saying very much during this, or they may blurt out, say, one word, and we'll come back to that later. So that, that trance state, that freedom from day-to-day -day ruminative mind, um, this can lead to an, an absence of dysphoria, which is what most of our, our patients come in with, a sense of relief. Um, for many, it's the first time in years they've experienced themselves without the dysphoria. It then opens up the question, well, who am I without the dysphoria? Now what can I do? Um, let's see. Yeah, the, the, there's a potential to, to really disrupt that. And that, that for us as the therapist, that then opens up a lot more room to, to engage in, in therapeutic work and encourage clients along a, a path of change. As well in this out-of-body experiences, it, uh, we talk about uh, perinatal matrices described by Stanislav Grof. Um, there is a possibility of re-experiencing uh, and healing of a birth experience, often expressed through transpersonal visions. And so we witness oftentimes uh, patients experiencing all of the four basic perinatal matrices, of course, and not in the same order or you know, not in the same session. And uh, so here is a description of uh, one of the patients in moderate dose session. I was a fetus, but I was floating in space with an umbilical cord attached to the earth below me. There was a woman's face, disembodied, ethereal, yet infinitely compassionate, looking down on me. I felt so safe, held and loved, as if nothing bad could ever happen to me. So I specialize in working with trauma. And in session, oftentimes, clients are able to reprocess traumatic memories and put the trauma in the past, moving toward peace, less of a vigilance, and a new sense of self. Uh, so I worked with a client, Marian, uh, who was a survival of a severe childhood uh, physical abuse. And so in her session, she started to uh, re-experience the abuse by her mom 
And for the first time, she was able to fully fear the, feel the fear, the terror that she experienced, as well as sadness and compassion towards herself. And I was encouraging her to stay with the feelings, to be able to look at the memories. And she was able to do that. And then she said, now I am being transported to a new home in the countryside. Wow, I'm experiencing a whole new childhood. I'm spending my days running in the fields with animals and having a loving family. In the days and weeks after the session, she reported a cessation of long-term eating disorder and as well dramatic decrease in her anxiety. And for the first time in her life, she no longer had nightmares. So now I'd like to share a recording. We'll see if uh, technology cooperates with us. And you can hear a patient in her own words. Um, is this going to work? We'll see. All right. Yeah. So anyway, I, I was um, away on a retreat this weekend. And... Okay. And the patient, as uh, she was coming out of her very first at-home ketamine session, um, sent me a, a recording that she had used um, her phone to record. And so it was a lovely gift to receive as I was kind of going into my own retreat experience. Um. So, yeah, we can just read this. I am emerging with what, has, uh, emerging what has been such a beautiful and powerful theme of this journey most profoundly experienced in ways that are deeper <laughs> than words could ever describe, both giving birth to myself and being birthed by myself. I could experience myself mothering me, guiding me. I was able to experience myself as my own therapist. And this is a, a woman whose mother had been quite intrusive um, and neglectful during her life and had a really hard time experiencing any self-compassion um, or really any love for herself. And so this was a, definitely a breakthrough in, in our work together. And from an attachment perspective, I mean, this is, as therapists, this is exactly what we want for, for, for patients to be able to internalize this caring, nurturing mother and then, or parent, and then to, to become that, to really um, begin to take care of their, themselves that way. All right, so the near-death experience, um, described as a simulation of an actual death experience, a departure from one's own body, um, sometimes including complete ego dissolution, or a loss of identity. So um, people who experience this may experience themselves as a, a single point of consciousness, sometimes kind of floating um, somewhere, simply aware of actions, how their actions have affected themselves and others, and experience a reliving of their own life. So near-death experiences can lead to experiential insight into day-to-day to -day problems, and also um, a new understanding of, of life and death. And I've been working with a, a long-term cancer survivor around um, end-of-life anxiety. And this sort of work has been extremely beneficial for, for her. So I had a client, uh, Blanca, who came with a long-term depression, treatment-resistant depression. And she, as a child, she had an experience of almost draw, being drawn in a bathtub. And so in the second session, we did a moderate dose. She started to re-experiencing, finding herself being underwater, not being able to breathe, which brought a lot of fear and panic. And even with me supporting her and encouraging her to stay with the process, she wasn't you know, willing or able to stay with that. So we did integration of the session and more preparation. And then in the following session, she again started to re-experience the same feelings. So she, um, went in and she said, I have died, I have drowned. I now see myself walking out of my body and now I am seeing a light tunnel in the sky. It is exquisite, experiences from my life passing by.
She then reported less attachment to even the most painful experiences from her life, feeling empathy for herself and others, and less stress about everyday challenges. She then re said, re-entering to her body, I never felt so comfortable and embodied. I feel renewed energy, motivation, and desire for living my life fully. I cannot wait to leave the office and start living. So that this completely shifted her perspective on her life, and kind of her depression has lifted since that session. So there are a variety of, of other experiences that people can have, which due to time, we, we won't go into a lot of these you can see listed here. Um, but people often spontaneously report visiting other realms, encounters with other beings, um, reliving past lives, and, and that sort of thing. And so ego dissolving transcendental experience is something what uh, people experience in the high dose ketamine. Um, I'll kind of read what uh, from Dr. Kahardi Harris. Um, it's in an outside. You can see the poster. Um, ego dissolution mediates long-term increases in trade liberalism and decreased authoritarianism. Long-term psychological changes in personality and direction of increased openness, including liberal political perspectives. So with those high-dose experiences, we can see really shifts in personality, a resolution of long-term standing patterns, addictions, sometimes psychosomatic diseases. And we have a great um, quote again from one of our patients here. So this is a pretty long one, so bear with me. Um, Honestly, I was scared during the most intense part of the journey. It was like a handshake with death. I was so confused to learn that all of what I thought as certain was a temporary narrative, a version of reality that had been slowed down to suit my body's current bandwidth. I had disappeared. My name, my gender, all of the labels that construct who I am were stripped down and pulled away until I was gone, flowing through a constantly changing form that seemed like some sort of a city that never stopped changing. I was completely alone and with everything. All of these concepts that I'd heard about were felt. Upon reflection, you and Veronica had mentioned almost every aspect of what happened. You had cognitively prepared me for what I experienced, planting seeds, as you said, that became mental placeholders for what was to come. It was so intense. And this was someone who had done quite a bit of other psychedelic work. The first half of the journey was more akin to other psychedelic experiences I've had and that I was meandering through in insight-laden imagery and came to some feelings of deep em empathy for my partner's mom with whom I have a tenuous relationship. It was lovely. The second half was so unlike anything I've ever felt before. I was gone. As I came back, the room became a temple and I got to return to my blissfully slow body. Oh my God, I've never felt so grateful for my bones. My body felt so sturdy, so mine. And she later told us, as someone who struggled with subclinical body dysmorphia, this shift has been one of the more profound ones since my treatment. I feel my body differently. I've also noticed that I ha have a new reference point, a wider end of the spectrum for felt bodily senses. So just to wrap up here, as with any treatment, there are always complications, challenges, um, there are medical contraindications that, that make people not good candidates for this. Um, psychological contraindications, we we're still learning so much about what diagnoses and what type of people respond well to ketamine and, and which ones don't. Um, and there can always be challenges, as with, as with any treatment. But we, we don't see challenges as a, a bad thing, um, much like childbirth. There's often a beautiful outcome. And so when we can support people through these challenging experiences, they often result in profound changes and, and growth in their lives. Um, all right, we'll just wrap up real quick here. There's a training in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. There's the Ketamine Training Institute and CREA Institute, both in the Bay Area, California. Uh, there is as well conference for ketamine-assisted psychotherapy coming up in November. And as well, we're trying to make the ketamine therapy accessible to people who cannot afford it. So there is a foundation where people can donate, so people without uh, resources can have access to 
uh, this treatment. So Veronica and I are both trainers in the, the Ketamine Training Institute. So if you're interested in having training in your location, please reach out to us. We'd love to come visit you. All right. Thank you all for your time. So thank you, Veronica and Gregory. Um, we have time for three questions. <laughs> Yes, please, up there, yeah. Just a, just a question, how do you access the material, uh, the supply, who's the supplier of the ketamine? Yeah, so we work with a, a physician um, who's one of the co-founders of our company. Um, ketamine is a Schedule Three drug in the United States, so we order it by mail and it arrives by FedEx, and yeah, so it's pretty easy to work with. We also work with a, a compounding pharmacy in San Francisco that makes the lozenges for us. Be up there, yeah, 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 you, you, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a few rather practical questions. So first is, um, I didn't get it. Uh, did uh, do you give um, ketamine intravenously? And um, now that uh, ketamine is available as nasal spray, do you plan to change uh, the route of administration and? Maybe a third question, what is your um, take on like, the difference of um, subjective effects between ketamine and esketamine? Uh -huh. So, you know, we, don't, we use IM, intramuscular injections, and as well sublingual lozenges. So we have compounding pharmacy when people take it in their mouths, hold it for 15 minutes. So we don't use the IV model. And, you know, the reasons, there are a variety of reasons, but one way is like if it's very medical setting, so sometimes people are not as comfortable going into the experience. Sometimes people move during the experience, so it's not convenient being connected to uh, IV drip. And uh, we, you know, we're not thinking about working with the intranasal ketamine, but we have the possibility of having it in the compounding pharmacy as well made, not, you know, as the as ketamine that's being uh, sold, but... Um, you know, our focus is on the therapy that's facilitated by ketamine, so not using the ketamine only as the compound that helps with the antidepressant effect, which, you know, it as well does. But our main focus is on the therapy that is facilitated by the medicine. So, so far, we, we see no reason to play this game with Big Pharma when the drug we need is generic and very cheaply available. Well, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It was great. I personally opened a company due to a great experience with ketamine. So, cheers for that. And the question is, uh, what's the difference you think between, um, or the pros and cons between inhalation? And maybe my second question is, what do you think is the, the dose you need uh, to go into K-hole, we're calling it that way? Well, arrowwood.org can give you a lot of information on that in terms of dose and if you want to, you know titrate your dose. Um, you know, inhalation is a, a very effective method for, for many substances. In terms of working with it, you know, professionally, it's a, you know, it's a, a bit unusual to suggest to a patient that they snort a line. So, you know, we've tended to, to veer away from that. Um, so, I mean, but, but it's a very effective route of, of absorption. So, you know, the, the estimates that we are kind of working with are the, the lozenges, bioavailability, how much gets into the, the, the body, the bloodstream is 30 to 40 percent. Um, Insufflation is probably somewhere around 60 percent. Intramuscular injection, about 93 percent. Um, and then IV, of course, you know, 99 to 100 percent. So, you, know, you have those different ways of, of working with the medicine. But in terms of how much dose you need, yeah, check out Arrowwood. It, it and it's very individual, too, that every person, you know, like how we shown we had people with a low-dose ketamine who go to the K-hole, and some people can take very large doses and don't let go. So always start low and go yeah. slow. I don't know if I'm correct. Usually we should start low on everything, but I was thinking, like, this is an anesthetic. There's no really risk for, like, uh, overdose because the worst thing you could get anesthetic. So I was kind of like, let's say... Okay with that. So, uh, you, you won't be able to get your face to the line, <laughs> so you'll, you'll yeah. <laughs> Gregory, you overdose that Gregory way. and Veronica, yeah. let me ask uh, another more um, 
both practical and research-oriented questions. You've been using a lot of imagery, like classical imagery of the psychedelic, mm -hmm. um, traditional psychedelic field, California field. And I was thinking of some research, qualitative research in psychotherapy that shows that um, patients going to Freudian uh, therapies have rather Freudian dreams, patients going into Jungian th therapies have rather Jungian dreams or dream material. So, um, and, that, and that came up when, when you talked about um, concepts of Stan Graf that you formulated in the 1970s, like perinatal matrixes. So, um, my question is, um, what's, a, what's the role of suggestion in your, in your therapies, in your dialogues with the patients? Are you using the, these words, these concepts uh, yourself? And the second one is, do you believe in perinatal and the other matrixes? I'll take part one if you want part two. <laughs> so yes and yes. <laughs> um, yes to some extent. We, we, we give patients uh, an idea of a range of things that might happen, and we tell them that you might not experience any of those. Um, we, we really try to orient people to have a realistic expectation. A very good suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> just, just be curious about whatever your experience is. I mean, that's the, the really the, the gist of how we prepare them. Um, because, yeah, some people, it's just darkness. They're relaxed. They're not having visions. Not everyone has visions. I mean, I think we've all heard at this point, even with ayahuasca, the idea of visions is greatly inflated. Not everyone has them. And visions aren't necessarily important to the overall healing. Um, so we tell people they may happen, they may not happen. If... If, it's not, if you don't feel like you're having an experience, that's your experience, and go with that, and let's work with that. So people get very hung up on, you know, they're reading things in popular media, that didn't happen to me, the drug's not working, what's wrong with me? And so we really, going back to the idea of the inner healing intelligence, try to, you know, encourage people to have trust in the process, trust in themselves, trust in their mind, to just allow the experience to unfold. So, so, do you believe in perinatal matrices? <laughs> yes, and honestly, I would say that there is, you know, we have, we take the ketamine as a sacred medicine and hold it as a ceremony. And so there is definitely something what we are bringing in by the set and setting of our work. And Sten Grof is definitely a huge influence on our work and what is kind of what we are following as a lineage. And if I can add one more comment to that? A, a brief one. Since you asked, yeah. Um, it's also very um, client-led. So if someone comes in and they have shared with us that they have some sort of a spiritual belief or they have a framework, then I'm going to work with that. I'm going to, you know, massage that and, and play with that and encourage that. If they have none, then I'm, I might use less of that sort of imagery and language and, and just see what emerges. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>